video we're going to talk about units and units are incredibly important to physics. Physics is based on physical measurement. There's no fundamental mathematical truth uh, behind the reason why force is equal to mass times acceleration. That relationship holds because that's the way the universe works. And we discovered it, or rather Newton uh, discovered it, by making measurements of the universe. So he measured forces, masses, and accelerations and found that that's how they were related to one another. So to do this, we have to have a system that will allow us to quantify what a force is, what a mass is, and what an acceleration is. And we break it down into sort of the, the most basic components, uh, things like time and distance. And to do this, we need to have a system of units. And the system that we use throughout science is the System Antinational, que je dois faire mes excuses uh, pour mon mauvais accent français pour les francophones. Um, but it's a system, international system of units. Uh, we use the French abbreviation because French is the international diplomatic language. So our system is the SI system, but you've probably familiar or at least heard about a system uh, other than the SI system where people are using feet, inches, pounds, cubic furlongs, and a whole gamut of other uh, different weird sounding units. This is the old imperial uh, system, and we do not use this in physics, or in fact, pretty much anywhere in science, for two very good reasons. The first is that these units date back to the medieval, or even older, right? The, the pre-medieval, the origins, the, the very early origins of them, in fact, tend to come from sort of Roman times, which is where the pound and the foot come from, a foot, of course, based on the length of someone's foot. So these, units are extremely old and they predate much of the science that actually allows us to define what we're measuring. The best example of this is in fact the pound. The pound is sort of both a unit of force and a unit of mass depending on how you use it and the problem with that is that we know now because of Newton's work in the early 1700s that mass and force are not the same thing. And so when you have a mass and you have a weight, which is just a force, you have to have different units because they are different physical quantities. Back in Roman times, they just used the pound as a way to measure a you know, quantity of some substance. And they had no idea that mass and weight were fundamentally different things. They had no idea what a gravitational field was, right? So these units, uh, the old system of units, are largely based on unscientific ideas that we now know to be wrong, um, and so they're not suitable for modern scientific work. I mean, of course, there is a sort of stopgap solution where they have both a pound mass and a pound force, and they also have a sort of a, an imperial unit of mass, which is the slug, but these are sort of bolt-on systems, and I would not be at all surprised if you've never heard of the unit called the slug. Um, so we use the SI system. The other reason we use the SI system is because the imperial system, or rather sort of the, the non-metric type system that, at least in Canada, was the imperial system, has no common standards for quite a few of the units. The best example of this is the pint. So the imperial pint, which is the pint that was used here in Canada and was also used in the UK and in fact all around the world pretty much, um, has 20 fluid ounces in one pint and it comes out to be I think about 568 milliliters and if you scale that up to a gallon because there's a certain number of pints in a gallon, you end up with a uh, imperial gallon being a volume equal to 4.5 liters. However, the US pint has only got 16 fluid ounces and so their gallon which has the same number of their pints in it is only 3.8 liters so if you're using pints and gallons you not only have to say this is a gallon you have to say this is a US gallon or this is an imperial gallon or who knows who else has got a standard for the gallon so there's no agreed upon international standard for many of these sort of old imperial uh, units there are for some but not for others, and that just makes the system completely useless for, for um, science when you're communicating on a global scale and everybody needs to know what you have actually measured and what the value of that measurement was. So for those two big reasons, we don't use them. The other sort of side reason is that 
you know, using these, mixing and matching these sort of imperial units with the uh, SI system leads to horrendous problems. And you only have to ask NASA uh, to find out one of the uh, uh, well-known examples for that. They lost a probe around Mars because the engineers building the probe were all using feet, inches, furlongs, and what have you. And the scientists were all using uh, meters and seconds. And they got the conversion factor wrong, um, burnt the wrong amount of fuel, and plowed their incredibly expensive probe into the surface of Mars. An uh, example that's actually closer to home and actually a lot more in many ways uh, uh, dangerous was the example of the Gimli Glider, which was a flight uh, from Montreal to Edmonton, I think it was in 1983, that ran out of fuel. Canada had just converted to the metric system and this uh, uh, plane had a problem with its fuel gauges, so in they didn't actually have to have the fuel gauges function for the flight to operate safely. Instead, they had to load the correct amount of fuel. And this is where they ran into problems because the uh, pilots thought that the amount of fuel that they'd been given was a mass in kilograms, whereas in fact, what they'd been given is the mass in pounds. So they had half the amount of fuel they needed. And um, somewhere over Manitoba, they ran out of fuel and had to make an emergency landing at the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, or well, disused Royal Canadian Air Force Base in Gimli, which was actually being used as a, a motorsport event, and you can go look that up on Wikipedia if you want to see the, the pictures and, and the details of that. Nobody died because the pilots did an amazing job of landing a 767 plane with no engines working because they had no fuel on board. Um, so that's the sort of mistakes that can crop up if you start mixing and matching unit systems. So we are going to exclusively use scientific units and for this course that pretty much means the SI system of units or systems of units that are based on the SI system. So I'm sure you're already somewhat familiar with the SI system, but let's just go and have a look at what makes up uh, the SI system of units uh, as a bit of a refresher. Now the SI unit system has several components to forming a unit. So the first part, which goes sort of uh, in front of the unit, is the prefix. So for example, if we have the unit of centimeters like this, the C here is the prefix uh, centi. This is used to avoid having to have ridiculous strings of digits or ridiculously high exponents uh, for units um, because it builds it in here. So for example, the centi uh, prefix is 10 to the minus two, um, and that's why there's 100 centimeters in a meter. And the second part here, this is the unit itself. And so uh, for centimeters, we have one hundredth of the unit of length, which is the meter. Now the other thing uh, that can go here is we could have a power. So this would be, for example, centimeters squared. And so we can have a power here. And the key thing to remember with the powers is that they apply to the prefix as well. So when we write uh, centimeters squared, what we mean is centimeters in brackets squared. And so while a centimeter is equal to 10 to the minus two meters, a centimeter squared is equal to 10 to the minus four meters squared because we have squared the prefix, the 10 to the minus two, as well as squaring the unit, the meter. So let's have a look at the standard SI prefaces. So here are the SI prefaces that increase the number of units. Now, the first two here, um, we are basically never going to use. Um, you are technically supposed to know them, but I, I can tell you um, I use them so infrequently. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever used them that you really, that these, these were not going to ask you about. Um, these ones, however, you are expected to know and you're expected to know all of them. However, chances are that you're pretty safe once you get past Giga or at least Terra that we are we are unlikely to, to, to use them. Um, kilo, you should be familiar with. You know, you have kilograms and you have kilometers. Um, and so, you know, these ones occur quite a lot. 
Um, mega is um, not very common, um, but it will occur in this course when we talk about mega newtons or uh, mega um, newtons per square meter um, when we're dealing with, um, well, bulk modulus, which can be measured in mega newtons per square meter or, if you prefer, mega pascals. And the same goes here for giga. Uh, we may deal with problems with giga newtons, but more likely it'll be giga newtons per square meter or giga pascals when we deal with this quantity called bulk modulus, um, which we'll deal with when we're dealing with acoustic waves. So not, not until we're about halfway through the course will this crop up. But there you will see the, the prefix giga. Uh, for Terra, um, probably not in this course, but if you're familiar with the Large Hadron Collider, then the energy of each of its beams of protons is just under 7, and then it's TeV, Terra Electron Volts, and an electron volt is a unit of energy. It's the energy that an electron gets when it moves through a potential difference of one volt. And so it's basically just the, the charge on the electron times one volt. So it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules. Um, and so this is the energy of one of the proton beams in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, but if you uh, work on, for example, Ice Cube, then we have uh, neutrinos which have Peta electron volt energies. So this is you know about a thousand times higher in energy than the Large Hadron Collider. Unfortunately, we can't collide the neutrinos of that energy together because they're pretty rare. They're produced from astrophysical sources um, that are not even in our galaxy. They're actually outside our, our galaxy, or at least the evidence we have so far suggests that. So these are insanely high energy particles. And to give you an idea, right, so 10 to the 15 is peta, and we multiply this by 10 to the minus 19. So these are subatomic particles with about a tenth of a millijoule um, of energy, which is uh, ridiculously high given the tiny size of the particle. So these are the prefaces that increase the number of units. What about the prefaces that decrease the uh, size of the unit? So these are the sort of the flip side of the prefaces. These are the ones that make things get uh, smaller. So we have deci and centi. Well, centi you should be familiar with because you have definitely heard of centimeters before, and that's why there's a hundred centimeters in uh, one meter. Um, the reason is because centi is 10 to the minus two. So one centimeter is 10 to the minus two of a meter. Uh, deci is a less common one um, if you, well, you're probably not quite old enough yet, but in another year's time or so, if you visit, um, if we ever get to travel again and you visit uh, Europe, then you will often find that you can buy wine in a European restaurant in deciliters, right? So a tenth of a litre. So milli, again, uh, you're familiar with this from millimeters. You know, 10 millimeters make uh, one centimeter, a thousand millimeters make a meter. Um, micron uh, or micro uh, is a micrometer. It's often, particularly in fact by engineers, called a micron. Um, so one micrometer is exactly the same as a micron. Um, and here, this sort of scale, we're talking the you know width of a, of a human hair, you would measure in uh, microns. Uh, nanometers, right? So this is now 10 to the minus nine, a billionth of a, a meter. So a nanometer is roughly the size of an atom, right? So an atom is sort of of order one nanometer, sometimes a little bit big, uh, sometimes a little bit smaller, maybe a tenth of a nanometer. Um, but this is the order of magnitude of um, an atom. Now, uh, pico, um, here we're getting small. There really, really isn't a good distance scale uh, that works for, for, for picometers, but if we drop down even smaller and we go to uh, femtometers, then we get to the size of a nucleus, right? So a nucleus in the center of an atom has the size of, uh, you know, femtometers. So 
Typically, these can be an order of, you know, a few femtometers. The atom is on the order of a, uh, you know, fraction of a nanometer. And so that gives you a sort of a, a, an idea of the scale difference between an atom and a nucleus. A nucleus is insanely dense compared to the atom. So everything around us basically is empty space that's just filled with electrons with these tiny, tiny nuclei right in the center. Now, by the time you get down to, to Atto, this is sort of the distance scale that we can probe at our highest energy uh, experiments. So the highest energy particle collisions uh, that we, we study, study distances at the order of an atometer, right? So this is not morning, this is atometer, it's a unit of, of distance. Um, the one sort of physical measurement that has actually got down to this level um, is not so much in terms of distance, but in terms of Atto seconds, um, and they are now capable of developing some incredibly accurate clocks that can, you know, sense time differences in the order of sort of Atto seconds, and they are now so accurate that they can actually measure the uh, the sensitive to the uh, gravitational time dilation over the height of a room, say. So they can measure uh, a difference in the passage of time. Uh, you know, if you have two of these clocks, they're accurate enough that you could actually measure a difference in the passage of time between the top of the room and the bottom of a room simply due to the Earth's gravitational field. Um, Unfortunately, at least the ones I, I saw the article on, uh, the clock itself was about the size of the room, so not going to be particularly great at the moment, but if they ever shrink these down, there are going to be some really fun relativity demos uh, that we could do with them. Um, so that's it for prefaces. Now let's have a look at the units and how we can classify them into one of two types. So this set of seven units are what we call um, base units. So these are the units in the SI system which are defined by measurement. And so the ones that are going to be most relevant uh, for this course are going to be these uh, three here. So we have the unit of length, which is the meter, um, and that is defined as the distance that light can travel in approximately um, 1 over 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, seconds. And it's defined that way because it's based on the speed of light. And the speed of light, um, if you ever take a course that covers relativity, the speed of light is a universal constant. It doesn't matter how fast you are moving relative to the light, you will always measure the speed of light as exactly the same value as everybody else in the universe. Um, and the reasons for that is because space and time don't quite work this way that, that Newton thought they did. Um, and when you get to high velocity, things are different. Um, and the speed of light turns out to be an absolute universal physical constant. So you can define the length in terms of time and the speed of light. Uh, the second is defined in terms of vibrations uh, of a, a cesium um, atom. Uh, the kilogram, and this is the only SI base unit which includes the prefix, right? None of the other ones you'll notice have a prefix. The SI unit of mass has a prefix. It is the kilogram. It used to be defined as the mass of a lump of uh, platinum iridium alloy, I think it was, in Paris. And that was the case up until 2018. And then it changed. And for the first time, um, we could do experiments that were accurate enough to define a kilogram by measurement, which was great because although it's fantastic to travel to Paris, um, you know, to, to compare your you know mass against the standard one that, that's uh, kept in Paris, um, this is not a very um, practical method. And in fact, there were some issues with it because it seemed like despite all the precautions they took storing it in, in a series of you know bell jars and so on, this kilogram was losing mass or at least appeared to lose mass compared to all the other countries' standards, which were standardized against the one in Paris. Um, that's now no longer the case because we have a measurement that defines it. It's defined in terms of another universal constant called Planck's constant. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of how it's defined, but you can look it up on the web. It was a relative, very recent thing, only changed in 2018. And so now all of our base mechanical units, if you like, are defined in terms of measurements. Now, on top of that, we have ones for electricity, and this is the current. It's not the charge, 
current is the fundamental base unit uh, that's defined by SI. For temperature, we have the Kelvin. Um, this is the only temperature scale I'm aware of where the temperature is always positive in, in Edmonton, no matter what time of year. Um, we have mole, which defines the amount of substance. So this is something that, that chemists use. And then we have this sort of rather bizarre one that defines luminous, uh, luminous intensity, uh, which is called the candela. Um, and we're, we're, we're never going to use that. I, um, I can think of no circumstances we're going to use moles in this course. Um, and it's unlikely that we will use either of uh, electric current or, or temperature, but they, they may crop up. So those are the base units. Now, the other class of units uh, that you get in the SI system are called derived units. And these are created by assembling combinations of the base units. And really the purpose of these is to just make life easier for ourselves. So for example, the Newton is the unit of force, and since force is mass times acceleration, it's defined in terms of the base units as kilogram meters per, per second squared, right? But it's a lot easier to say Newton than it is to say kilogram meters per second squared everywhere, particularly when we start doing things like, you know, Newtons per square meter, and then you'd have to have, you know, kilograms per meter per second squared. And you can start adding things on when you've got forces involved with ele electricity, then you're going to have currents and things in there as well, and it's going to become a, a, a real mess. So rather than do that, what we do is we use a derived unit called the Newton. Now, the way these are written is if you write out the name uh, longhand, right, of course it's based on Sir Isaac Newton, but if you write out the name longhand, it uses a, uh, it does not use a capital letter. It is not Newton's name. It is the name of the unit, and the unit name does not start with a capital letter. But just to make things maximally confusing, the symbols for these units generally do use a capital letter. So, for example, Joule is named after uh, uh, Joule, who did a lot of work uh, early on with, with energy. And so it has a lowercase j, even though it's based on a name, but a capital symbol j. Uh, Watt is, in fact, a um, physicist and, and even an engineer, worked on uh, the invention of the steam engine uh, in the UK lowercase w for the name of the unit, capital W uh, for the uh, power, similar things like the magnetic field, we use the Tesla, capacitance, we use the Farad from um, uh, Michael Faraday, um, pressure, we use the Pascal, although personally this is part where I think it just goes too far and I will actually use the uh, newtons per square meter in preference to the Pascal. They are exactly the same, but newtons per square meter tells you that you've got a force per unit area, which is, I think, a bit more illustrative. But for things like, you know, for example, the capacitance, I'm always going to use Farad because who the heck wants to use this sort of, of crazy thing with seconds to the fourth amp squared, you know, per meter squared per kilogram, right? I mean, that would be insane. We, we, use, uh, we use the Farad. So those are the derived units which make up the rest of the SI system. So now you've seen the SI system of units. Hopefully that refreshed your memory. Hopefully this isn't the first time that you've seen it, but you now know how to construct and use SI units. Now, as well as the SI unit system, there are a few couple of specialized unit systems that may also crop up from time to time in physics. Uh, the astronomers, for example, use the centimeter grams second CGS uh, units because that makes things a little bit easier for, for their calculations. Of course, these are based on the same underlying system that operates the SI. It's just that we're using centimeters instead of meters, grams instead of kilograms, and so on. The system that we use in particle physics is actually called the natural uh, system of units and there we actually build in relativity which is sort of missing from the SI system so we, we take it one notch for, forward and so we can use the same units for both energy and mass uh, which is useful in particle physics because we're converting mass to energy and vice versa um, and so we define C, the speed of light, as one um, and we also define this constant called h-bar, which is just Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. We also set that to have a value of 1, and that gives us, 
what we call natural units. And you saw a little bit of an example of that uh, because electron volts um, are part of that sort of uh, system of units. Um, and that's the system we use in particle physics. So these, of course, though, are still all based and easily related to the SI uh, system of units. So that's it for units. In the next video, we'll have a look at how we use calculus to define our basic kinematic quantities.